Hello and welcome to History 342. Today we're going to talk about the Japanese economic miracle. Why am I using quote marks when I talk about the Japanese economic miracle? Well, um, quick story. Uh, the Japanese, the Japanese state that you and I have grown up with, well that I grew up with and then you grew up with, is very very wealthy um, and it would generally be perceived as kind of a classic first world nation to use the kind of Cold War language so as a developed nation, to use more recent language as a wealthy nation, um, to use perhaps, I guess, you know, kind of basic language. And this all happened, certainly from a Western perspective, very, very quickly. Um, in 1945, and indeed going into 1950, uh, your typical American serviceman uh, walking around the city of Tokyo, any major Japanese city, uh, was seeing poverty and misery and um, a lot of destruction. And Tokyo and other Japanese cities were not alone in this. I mean, Western Europe had been devastated. That's why the Marshall Plan was a thing. Um, but by the 1980s, the Japanese are, you know, buying Rockefeller Plaza and doing other things that are freaking Americans out. More about that in a future video. And so the sheer rapidity of this economic development is often dubbed an economic miracle. So why the problem, why we you know why the quotes? Well, there's some discussion in the field about, you know, the extent to which this is appropriate. Why is it so miraculous that the Japanese do it? Um, you know, is this is this unwittingly, unintentionally condescending or patronizing towards the Japanese? I think that perhaps it could be. Certainly there were articles written in the Western press in the 1970s and 1980s that were kind of patronizing. Um, of the Japanese, but the other side of it, which I think has to be recognized, is the economic growth during this period is astounding. It is astonishing. It is phenomenal. The Japanese economy grew at leaps and bounds that you know had never been seen, um, or hadn't been seen before. I, I sound like a politician now, um, and that until similar numbers coming out of China in the late nineties and early two thousands, um, well, early nineties going into the two thousands, uh, really kind of wasn't expected to be seen again. Japan was this phenomenal. Um, kind of economy growing at rates that were just just mind-blowing and astonishing and changing in real terms and becoming um, by virtue of its economic power and economic weight one of the most important countries in the world um, and this happens alongside of course Japan's rehabilitation um, you know they had been antagonists in World War II they 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 bombed Pearl Harbor I mean they, they you know they'd been to use overly simplistic language they were the bad guys um, and as early as you know, 1946, they're the good guys again. In fact, that transition to being good guys, or at least Cold War allies of the United States, is integral to the emergence of what we now know as the economic miracle, or what we could perhaps describe a bit more uh, with a bit less kind of awkwardness as the era of high speed growth. Uh, the Korean War, which ran from 1950 to 1953, uh, was beneficial to the Japanese economy more broadly. Uh, the American government deliberately uh, ran procurement orders through Japan, um, including munitions and other things like this, e effectively kind of giving the Japanese economy a massive kind of injection, um, an injection of capital um, and industrial activity, industrial orders and things like that, that gave the Japanese kind of some sense of life. Uh, war procurements were worth about two billion US dollars to 1951-1953 and accounted for 60% of all of Japanese exports. Now what's interesting about this, and it's something I'll return to a couple of times in the lecture, um, is that one of the problems about economic miracle language is that it kind of acts almost like this happened maybe by accident or or happened, for example, you could learn about the procurements and, and the American role in the procurement boom and think, right, if it were not for American investment, this would never have happened. And therefore there's a general problem here of reducing Japanese agency. And be very careful about that. Because the fact of the matter is that Japanese, individual Japanese in particular, took decisions that um, in many cases maximized on the existing advantages that came out of American aid or created entirely opportunities all of their own. So for example, what corp Japanese corporations did in response to the war procurement boom in their 1950s was they took their profits and immediately funneled it back into infrastructure and into developing their own kind of industrial infrastructure, rebuilding in some cases, but also building new capacity. So there's this shared interest among Japanese business leadership to kind of create a sustained long-term strategy. And this suits American policy and American strategy. The Americans want Japan to be, there's talk of Japan being a warehouse of Asia. Certainly they want a free democratic Japan. This is a standard goal in American post-war policy. 
that has often, you know, I think with with some justification been critiqued. I'm currently teaching a class on Vietnam, for example, where all this language has be, kind of becomes very problematic and very complex. But um, they do mean it um, and they are aware that a free Japan, whatever the heck that means, has more likelihood of being free and being independent and democratic if uh, it's doing well economically. And and this kind of, and there's a dovetailing here, which uh, certain United States would be a, a big proponent of, that capitalism and democracy go hand in hand. So, so um, but, but on the American side, it's kind of this broad, you know, idea, although it's true during the occupation until 52, 53, the Americans have a direct role in things, but there's this role in Japanese leadership to uh, continue developing these same kinds of concepts. In fact, the period that is called an economic miracle in the West, we would typically, as I said, dub the era of high-speed growth. And this runs roughly from the 1950s to the 1970s. You see astonishing change in Japanese society. The Japanese gross national product expanded by an annual average of 10% every year between 1950 and 1973. 10%. This is astounding. Before the coronavirus crisis hit, the American economy was on track to hit maybe 3% growth this year, which wasn't quite what, you know, perhaps some people in politics wanted, but is a really good, strong, healthy rate of growth. Uh, when I was your age uh, and the Celtic Tiger was really kind of, you know, taking flight, I'm mixing, mixing metaphors, but so what? Uh, in, during Ireland's kind of great periods of economic growth, Ireland was regularly posting annual GNP growth of 3 to 4%. That's 3 to 4%. And at the end of the 20th century, that was considered a fantastic you know, return. God, what are the Irish doing? This is so good. This is so clever, whatever they're doing. The Japanese have a 10% growth rate. They're growing their economy theoretically by 10% every year. By 1973, they're the third biggest economy on the planet. And this means real economic change for many, many Japanese. Ikeda Hayato, uh, Ikeda was uh, Prime Minister of Japan uh, in the 1960s, and he basically runs on this idea of what's called income doubling, um, which is he basically promises to double the income of Japanese, the average income of the Japanese person in 10 years. They do it in seven. They double the income of almost every Japanese person. Like So on, on average, the average income has been doubled in seven years. This is astonishing. And this is in the, this is accomplished by the mid to late 60s. They haven't even got to the end of the, this kind of period of high-speed growth just yet. What's the secret to the Japanese success? Well, this becomes a huge question, particularly in the West and in the 1980s. There are so many books written about what the Japanese are doing right and, and what, could the, what could Americans and British people and other groups do to emulate the Japanese. Um, and there tended to be this focus on kind of the strong, you know, cultural collectivist idea of Japanese society, what some ascribe to as Confucian ethics. Be very, very careful here. Confucianism as a philosophy does its true stress, conservatism with a small c, hierarchies, respecting not just those in your family group who are older than you, but also people in positions of power, respecting um, structures of power and everything else. Sure. I mean, there, there, of course, there, there, there are elements of that in the same way that I make the same dumb joke every class I ever teach, that um, Plato has heavily influenced the majority of you in the way you look at the world and think about individuality and rights. It doesn't mean that you are bringing Plato up at a party on a Friday night or, for that matter, the platonic ideals of every single thing that you ever do. Uh, how does this translate in Japan? Well, there is certainly a kind of a collective idea here, um, or a collective goal at least in place. So Ikeda, Prime Minister Ikeda, who had promised um, income doubling, had also kind of, he had stressed social harmony um, in order to make, you know, this economic growth happen. And what social harmony translates into for the more cynical would be getting unions to kind of come to heel. Um, and this is kind of, you know, um, that's largely kind of what happens. Japanese unions, it's not that they're weak per se, it's just the Japanese union leaders kind of take on this, uh, take on an identity of having a collective share in the country benefiting along with um, the, the corporate leaders. So although the union leaders who represent labor and the corporate leaders who represent capital have kind of an inbuilt kind of competitive uh, relationship, in practice, they will put it aside as much as they can 
to kind of, uh, you know, are, are, you know, put to one side for now or agree to certain compromises in various kind of labor rights and everything else if you're seeing um, an improvement in the internet, in the, in, sorry, an improvement in the national economic situation. And so, of course, when people's incomes are literally doubling in only a matter of years, then yes, it's a lot easier for the union leaders to swallow this themselves and to deliver it to um, labor. And this can be understood as well, you know, this factors into very specific government goals such as, quote, administrative guidance um, and industrial policy, where the government is taking kind of a, um, you know, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I'll stick with collective, a kind of a collective approach to improving the economy. There's a kind of a fascinating um, continued evolution of the old Zaibatsu idea. So you guys remember the Zaibatsu or these large companies being run by uh, men who, who basically are in negotiation or in discussion with the government frequently or in kind of, you know, certainly at least touching base with the government and, and kind of conforming to a general strategy. We're seeing this in 1960s, 1970s Japan. We're seeing the government take an active role in kind of shaping um, strategy um, and driving kind of specific ideas of which way the economy should um, go. So, for example, they were very, very interested in uh, Japanese industry providing consumer cars. They were very interested in broader industrial capacity. And lo and behold, now in 2020, the Japanese are very strong in both these areas. I myself drive a Japanese car. I'm sure many of you, uh, either you or your parents drive um, Japanese or even now Korean cars. I drive a Honda, by the way, and Honda Soichiro, uh, the founder of Honda, very interesting figure, and one of many um, kind of younger, um, early on, younger Japanese entrepreneurs who actually bring a really important layer of complexity to this notion that the government is effectively leading a collective effort to improve, um, you know, to improve the economy. The reality is there was a lot of reliance on Japanese entrepreneurs. So, for example, Honda, you know, the Japanese government really wanted um, a Japanese big three, like you had up in Detroit here in the United States. They wanted three big companies and they're going to tag three companies. And these, this is how we'll do it. So what the Americans did. And the, the, the Japanese car companies such as Toyota and Nissan um, and Mitsubishi kind of ignored them. They kind of did their own thing anyway. Um, and Honda was probably the best example of this. Honda Soichiro had this idea that he was going to make motorcycles and sell them to Japanese people and then to Americans. And everyone thought he was mad. It's like, who, who on earth, who's going to ride a Japanese motorcycle? And the rest is history. Another company that kind of grew despite not opposition from the government, but certainly a reluctance to support them was Sony. Sony was founded by two brothers uh, who had to fight and fight and fight um, to get permission to build transistors, transistor radios. Um, and they're, you know, from the 1950s onwards, Sony becomes a world leader in radio technology, ultimately resulting, of course, in personal audio players, the much loved Walkman, which I'll probably talk about um, in a couple of videos. For years after the era of high speed growth, there are these, there's so many attempts to figure out what did they do right, especially from the, the Western perspective. What have the Japanese done? Can we emulate this and everything else? And there's lots of different kinds of ideas of trying to figure out like what happened. Um, despite, so for example, you have things like quality control circles. Despite the fact that um, the unions were largely kind of, you know, again, I, I shouldn't really say brought to heel, but the unions kind of buy into collective compromise um, and Japanese labor kind of agrees to give up certain kinds of possible rights or abilities to, to strike you know, widely and things like that. Um, certainly Japanese corporations put a lot of effort into including workers in different kinds of ways. And the most famous example of this is the Toyota Way, capital T, capital W, which is written about extensively eventually in the United States, which, you know, effectively is including various um, people who work at Toyota, even at very, very, quote unquote, low levels, you know, factory floor levels and stuff like that, to be part of discussions about how to improve the product and kind of report back to, you know, I'm the guy that puts the windows into the Corolla and um, this is something that I don't like, you know, and this is feedback you guys need. This is something that makes my job slower or here's a way it could be done better. And there's all these kind of interesting things that happen there. So although, and Japanese labor history, by the way, is a field unto itself. So there's a lot of stuff you can read about Japanese labor. And uh, I don't want to paint it as being rosier than it was, but also I need to be careful not to just kind of say that, you know, it was all a one-way street, quite complicated. Um, historians talk a lot about the three sacred treasures. Um, 
the lifetime employment system, the seniority wage system, and enterprise unionism. Enterprise unionism, I've kind of already talked about, basically, you know, corporate leadership friendly unions. Um, lifetime employment was effectively, especially at the height of the major corporations like Mitsubishi and Toto and all these companies, you'd come out of college and you'd get a job and you'd, that you'd just kind of work for Toyota forever. Um, and and that's just what you would do. And and you had you had pretty solid um, job security. Also, the seniority wage system meant that um, if you'd been a Toyota 30 years, it was virtually impossible that you'd be paid any less than a guy who got there five years ago. Um, and so these ideas that as you got up and up in the system, you get paid more and more and more. Now, there are weaknesses to this problem. And particularly, you know, pure capitalists would have massive, massive problems with the fact that, you know, I can't pay a super hotshot 33-year-old more than this 58-year-old who came out of college way back when and has just been here the whole time. Um, but it does bring, the other side of the coin is it brings kind of stability to the company and it generates kind of a corporate identity on the individual level, which is easier to maintain. Also in the broader public, you have 20% uh, rates of savings by the 1970s. Most of the population are saving huge chunks of their um, of their earnings, and although this is not ideal, perhaps from a consumer's perspective, it's very useful in making um, various amounts of capital and liquidity available to the central bank and to government planning going forward. So that Japan is able to kind of plan longer term. All of this change in economics brings about pretty major social change. You're seeing massively increased urbanization. About 75% of the Japanese population live in a Japanese city by 1975. Three in four people live in a city by 1975. This is not what Japan had been like 100 years earlier. Japan had been a fairly rural society, really. But Japan has become highly, highly urbanized. You're seeing this emergence of a, yet again, a newer middle class, a transition from private events to public events. So rather than having a birthday party for your child in your home with you there and your parents there, the child's grandparents and all these kind of different extended family ideas, it's now much more common to do what we're familiar with in the US now, for example, of going to, you know, maybe not Chuck E. Cheese, but some kind of a restaurant um, and kind of inviting other people. And part of the reason for this is kind of the increased urbanization. People are living in fairly small apartments where it's not really practical to be inviting large numbers over to your home. But also this has just become a, a more typical element for this newly emerging kind of professional class of the 1970s and 1980s. And you have this growth as well, a kind of of a, of a, of a corporate culture. Um, for example, lifetime employment was linked to education tracks. If you wanted to get a job at Toyota, well, there was a certain university you should go to. If you'd rather work for the government, you should go to this university. Um, as Sony gets larger and as Nintendo Nintendo eventually emerges, people are understand you go to such and such a major university if you want to get a job with that company. And of course, these corporations are holding such a massive sway. So imagine, for example, if you knew that to get a good job at Apple, you needed to go to the University of Kentucky. And that was it. Like that's, that was the way to go. Um, or on a national level, that everybody in America knew, every young person in America knew, Apple likes to hire from Harvard and Yale then that's what you would do. Um, and there are elements to which large American companies do this, but in Japan, it's a bit more, I don't want to say formalized per se, but it's certainly kind of more entrenched in kind of people's cultural understanding. There is uh, massive cultural elements here in terms of the role of corporation in people's lives. I mean, you look, for example, at video games, Final Fantasy video games, often talk about the corporation Shinra, Final Fantasy VII, and other games. This reflects a kind of a, a Japanese critique um, cultural critique of corporations taking this major cultural role in Japanese life. It has an impact, for example, on Japanese gender relations, where, like many other countries, for a long time, till quite late, till the 1970s, in Japan, um, when women got married, they lost their jobs, like almost immediately. Um, certainly, uh, it was just expected, oh, you're married now, go and have a baby and, and don't come back. Um, in these office spaces uh, for years, and there's still a lot of truth to this, um, Men are promoted primarily for various leadership positions and women are not promoted. Uh, women in these office spaces are the ones doing the typing and answering the phones and that kind of work and kind of clerical work, while men are kind of have making, the, you know, making the decisions. You know, 1970s Japan is not unique in this. I mean, lots of cultures had this kind of gender difference in the workplace, but particularly in a society that's so dominated by, uh, or is becoming dominated by, you know, a highly urban Japan dominated by corporate identity, um, this is developing as a problem. And then you have the, the arrival of the salary man. And the salary man, one word, salary man, um, is a concept that's been around in Japan for a long time, but certainly 1970s, 1980s takes on a whole new kind of 
life of its own. He's kind of the foot soldier of this amazing, you know, monstrously successful Japanese economy. He's a man. Um, and there's all these fascinating kind of cultural elements to it. The salary man, they all dress the same. They all wear these kind of dark, you know, affordable suits. They're all rushing to work all the time. Um, they're, you know, it, it's a culture that, you know, you, you stay until the boss day. So, you know, for a long time in Japanese society, you could be on your computer playing solitaire or something till 10 p.m. It didn't really matter as long as you were there when the boss came out of his office and you say, yes, sir, I'm here. And then he would go home and that meant that you could go home. Um, lots of anecdotal, you know, stories of women, young wives, young pregnant wives being berated by elderly neighbors um, because why is your husband at home every night by eight? Isn't he working hard enough? And this kind of this fascinating kind of absorption of, of these corporate concepts into Japanese culture um, becomes really, really kind of fascinating. And of course, you know, going from the the horrific um, misery um, and depression of the years immediately following World War II, this this is a big deal. And so there's a, it's not a surprise that many, many Japanese are investing their identities into this kind of corporate concept. So the discussion question for today is how do we balance the agency of Japanese entrepreneurs and the wider strategic policy of Japanese government and corporate leadership in assessing the era of high-speed growth. Okay, thanks for watching.